the reason we do have a children's program isn't just to display cuteness and have cuteness overload, right? It's a, it's a wonderful opportunity for us as well to inculcate into our children the important message of the gospel and that they are proclaiming truth with their innocent mouths, right? And, and we, sit, we thank the Lord for that, that we are investing in young people. And isn't it wonderful and a sign of a healthy church that we have this many kids? I think praise the Lord for that. So I'd like to pray, and then I have a few thoughts I want to share with you. should be only an hour or two, so you'll be all right. Uh, but, uh, but I do think it's an appropriate time of year um, to share some important truth from the Word of God. So let's pray, and then we'll, we'll talk. Father, thank you for this opportunity that we have. Thank you for these wonderful children. Uh, Lord, uh, you tell us in your word, let the little children come. And so we're grateful that you have blessed this church with an abundance of young ones. Uh, but at the same time, Father, there's a great responsibility that we have as a church to invest in them, to come alongside parents and to help them raise their children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Uh, that's a great responsibility. So I pray, Father, that you'd give us strength as a church to accomplish that mighty task as we invest in the next generation that we would be found faithful in that, and that you would take this next generation and you would reach countless people for Jesus Christ as a result. That's our earnest desire, Father, and we want to see you work in and through this, this local body. We thank you for all the people that are here today, the visitors that are here today, uh, that represent many other churches, and we pray that they would be blessed and encouraged. Uh, we pray for those here today that don't know you as Savior, uh, Father, that today would be the day of salvation for them. God, fill me with your spirit. Fill us all with your spirit as we hear a word from you. And it's in Jesus' precious name that we pray this. Amen. Audrey Mayer was widely known for decades uh, of the composer of many, many gospel songs and, and uh, hymns and, and choruses. One song in particular that she wrote, and it may be familiar to some of you, is called His Name is Wonderful. Uh, it was written in 1959, and, and it's probably the song that she's m best known for. She interest, interestingly wrote that song um, right after a children's program, uh, much like you've experienced today, their annual children's program at Bethel Union Church in California. And, uh, and, and as usual, just like we saw today, uh, there were angels and shepherds and, and uh, Mary and Joseph and, and, and all of that. And they were singing, sleep in heavenly peace. And, and then the pastor suddenly exclaimed, his name is wonderful. And Audrey says that she quickly grabbed her Bible at that point in time, and she searched the concordance for the names given to Jesus in the scriptures. And then from that, she composed the song that many of us are familiar with today and has been literally sung around the world. I'd like to take us to that particular text of scripture that deals with that word wonderful in Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 and uh, I read it for you a little while ago but I do want to share some thoughts with for you from this particular text of scripture in Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 it says this for unto us a child is born unto us a son is given and the government shall be upon his shoulders and his name shall be called wonderful counselor mighty God Everlasting Father and Prince of Peace. So well over 2,500 years ago, the prophet Isaiah uh, would, told of the one that would be the hope of all of mankind, the long-awaited Messiah who would establish his eternal kingdom based on justice and righteousness. And so Isaiah's important pronouncement told that this one would be a God-man, a child born. He would have humanity. He was a son given, but he would was also be one of deity. And so there were four names that we see here in this particular text that I want to I want to share with you. Now I want I want you to remember something that Isaiah the prophet was predicting something that would take place some 700 years later. Now that's mind-boggling if you allow your mind to think about how much time that is. Our country is only just under 250 years old. So we're talking about 700 years in the future that the prophet Isaiah is prophesying that a baby would be born, a son would be given to them, the Jews, the Jewish nation. And, and, and the promise was that he would be their king. In fact, that's what the word Messiah actually means is in the Hebrew language. It means king. He would rule and reign perfectly. He would be the king that they so desperately needed, a king that would rescue them from their most 
desperate need. So I want to take a quick look with you this morning uh, through these names, these four names. Uh, and, and the first one is this, Jesus is the wonderful counselor. Jesus is the wonderful counselor. Jesus Christ, the God-man, is wonderful. And if you doubt the wonder of our Savior, I challenge you over the next several months to slowly pour over the Gospels found in the New Testament. If, you, if you're familiar with your Bible, you know that they're the first, first few books in the New Testament. And I would encourage you to pour over them. We just finished as a church walking through the Gospel of John. And I preached 92 sermons out of the Gospel of John. I want to tell you just that one Gospel is rich and replete with wonder and awe as we look at, as we look at Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, Brother Bob here has been preaching or teaching in our equipping class through the Gospel of Mark. So all of this, I want to encourage you to spend some time pouring over this scripture, the scripture, the, these particular scriptures. If you don't have a Bible, it would be our great distinct honor to be able to give you uh, a, a Bible, and uh, we can make that happen. You just come and talk to me after the service. Uh, but I think it's that important that you make that kind of a commitment to explore for yourself. And I'm not exaggerating when I say that out of all the books of the Bible in human, uh, all the books in human history, there is no greater book than the Bible. This book has changed my life, and, and I am forever grateful for it. And it will change your life as well as you listen to the message. You see, Jesus is truly wonderful, but so is his word. And the simple reason that we can make this claim that Jesus and his word is wonderful, uh, according to the Apostle John, is found in verse, chapter 1 of verse 1, that Jesus Christ is, in fact, the word. So not only is Jesus wonderful, but his word is wonderful. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And that brings me to the point that I want to share with you that I believe Isaiah is making. Our Jesus is the wonderful counselor. His word accurately reflects his mind. For example, it is his word that brings life. In Psalm 119.50, it says, This is my comfort in my affliction, for your word has given me life. His word, it is his word that gives not only life, but it gives faith. In Romans chapter 10, verse 17, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. His word comforts us in the time of need. In Psalm 23, a very very famous psalm that's read at many funerals. But verse 4 says this, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. How many times have you, if you've walked with the Lord at any point in your life, you've found yourself in the Word of God receiving comfort and peace just by spending time with Him in His Word. It's his word that rebukes us. It doesn't just comfort us. It rebukes us when we need to get right with God. When we're heading down a road we ought not to go. It's the truth of the word of God that, that encourages us to get back on track. In 2 Timothy uh, verse, uh, chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, it says, All Scripture is breathed out by God, and it is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. God's, God's word will get us back in line. When we need to get back in line. And it is his word that counsels us in all aspects of life. In Psalm 16, 7, it says, I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night, also in my heart, he instructs me. It isn't, it isn't just a book giving you good counsel. It, this book is the mind of our wonderful counselor, Jesus Christ. And I believe that if you were given the opportunity to sit down with Jesus himself, if he were to show up here and sit down with you for a counseling session, and you shared with him a particular issue that you're struggling with, he would look at you with an, a winsome a look, with, with love and compassion in his eye, and he would say, you know, that thing that you're struggling with right now, I've answered that right here in this particular chapter, in this particular book. In this particular verse, he's the wonderful counselor. Jesus, through the Holy Spirit of God, in conjunction with his word, counsels millions of people successfully from pulpits, from offices, from kitchen tables, to coffee shops around the world. And he's been doing that for centuries. I don't know about the coffee shops part, but for centuries he's been ministering to people and counseling people 
through his word. It's those that humble themselves. It's those that humble themselves and listen to his truth and obey his commands that find out just how wonderful Jesus truly is and how pertinent and poignant his word is. Jesus is the Messiah, and not only is he the wonderful counselor, but number two, Jesus is the mighty God. He is and he will be and he was the God before whom everyone will bow their knee one day. This is the fact of the scriptures, that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Isaiah understood that the Messiah uh, is God, very God. In fact, it's interesting, and that's a very important point for us to remember. It's interesting, according to the Pew Research, 80% of Americans believe in God. 80% of Americans believe in God, which on the surface seems like a pretty good stat. However, this, this percentage really begs the question, what kind of God do they believe in? Who, who is it that they believe in? Unfortunately, many believe in a benign, benevolent deity who just desires for his creation to be deliriously happy. He's very kind, but he really can't do very much about the pain and the suffering and the evil that they are facing in their own lives. This, of course, is far different from the God that we see in the Holy Bible. God is good, he's kind, he's benevolent, he's full of love. Amen and amen. The Bible is replete with that information. But he's also almighty God. He is in charge of all things. Nothing gets past him and there is nothing that is too difficult for him. In Psalm 145, verses 4 and 5, it says, One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works I will meditate. Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah, in chapter 10, verses 11 or 12 and 13 says, It is he who made the earth by his power, who established the world by his wisdom and by his understanding, stretched out the heavens. When he utters his voice, there is tumult of waters in the heavens. And, and he makes the mist rise from the ends of the earth. He makes lightning for the rain and he brings forth the wind from his storehouses. He is mighty God. This mighty God we see in Colossians chapter 1 verses 15 through 20 that speaks of Jesus Christ himself. He, Jesus, is the image of God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning of the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. That little baby, that little baby, Jesus Christ, that we saw is this God, the creator God, the mighty God, no one to be trifled with. I'm not sure what you're facing today, but Jesus is the mighty God, and he can handle whatever you are facing. He is the creator of all things. In him, all things hold together. And he may just be allowing things to crush into your life today to draw you to himself, because he has a plan. He has a plan for you if you trust him and bring your faith to him. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, some of the sweetest words in the Bible, says, casting all your anxieties on him. Why? Because this almighty creator God cares for you. He cares for you. He can handle it because he's the mighty God. So Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the wonderful counselor, the mighty God. Number three, Jesus is the everlasting father. 
He's the everlasting Father. Now, wait a minute. You might be thinking to yourself, how can Jesus the Son be the Father? This can be a little bit confusing for us, for those of us that are, are, are understanding that we live in New Testament times. We, uh, for those of us that have walked with Christ very long, we understand that in the Bible it teaches there's a, there's a trinity in our God, right? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So, so how do we read this uh, with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? Well, we don't want to read into the text. We want to we understand what's going on here. But he is speaking, Isaiah is speaking of the coming Messiah in this passage, and he uses, uh, he uses this, this phrase, everlasting Father, for a reason. And I'm going to explain to you in just a second what this means. First of all, the first thing that I want you to see is that he is everlasting. Isaiah 40 verse 20 says that, have you not known, have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint. He does not grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He is everlasting. He is the eternal God. He is the beginning to the end. He is the alpha and the omega. And this is Jesus Christ that we're speaking of. But secondly, this, this idea that he is Father, how does that come to play? How do we answer that question, especially in light of the Trinity? Well, he is Father, the Messiah is Father in the sense that he will do everything that a good father will do. And do you know what a good father will do? He provides for his children, but he also protects them. And that's what Isaiah is talking about here. He's not talking about God the Father, but he's talking about the Messiah will function as a father who will protect and care for his children. Isaiah chapter 22 verse 21 says, And I will clothe him with your robe, and I will bind your sash on him, and I will commit your authority to his hand, and he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. The Messiah will be a protector, and and he will care for his people. In Job chapter 29, verse 16, God says, I was a father to the needy, and I searched out the cause of him whom I did not know. Jesus, the Messiah, from everlasting, was promised to be the father or the protector of the children of Israel. And you know what? He's our protector, too. If we are in Christ, he is our protector as well. So Jesus is the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, and then lastly... Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Now, all of these descriptions deserve a much more treatment that I'm giving them today. And I would encourage you to spend some time on your own mulling over this passage of Scripture in Isaiah chapter 9. You owe it to yourself to meditate through these things, these words, these descriptions of the Messiah. And they've, so far they've been pretty amazing of, of how uh, God describes the Messiah. Gives, to help us gain understanding to, whom he, to who he is. Uh, but, but listen, in my humble opinion, this one, the Prince of Peace, is the most significant and probably the most relevant to us here this morning. The Messiah would be born the Prince of Peace. Certainly, certainly the title Prince implies and indicates royalty, does it not? We understand we hear the word prince, we think automatically of, of England or, or some far off land where they still have, have that type of a system of government where they recognize kings and queens and princes and so forth. Well, the term prince implies royalty and Jesus was in fact, is in fact, as royal as they come. The Son of God, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. But he is no simple garden variety prince. He is the prince of peace. So he is royalty, but he is the prince of something in particular that Isaiah is pointing out to us right here, that he's the prince of peace. Now, now why do we need a prince who is in charge of peace? Listen, peace is not a warm, fuzzy feeling, but a cessation of war. That's what's going on. It's a cessation of war. Of war, And ever since Adam and Eve rebelled against God and, and his commands in the garden, we humans have been at war with God. And that's a problem. 
But it's interesting, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, God already talks about solving that problem of war between humankind and God. It says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. The Messiah was promised to come and crush the head of Satan, to destroy the works of the devil. But the fact is, is because of our rebellion against God, we are, in, in effect, at war with God. So there needed to be a deal brokered between God and mankind, a deal that would, would solve the problem. And the deal broker, if I can use that phrase, was Jesus Christ himself. So how did, how did he accomplish this? How did he broker this deal? Well, if you look in Romans chapter 5, verses 8 through 11, we get an idea. So, but God showed his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we now have been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. That's the broker. That's the deal. By the death of his son. Much more now we are reconciled. Now that we are reconciled, we shall live by, we shall be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through the Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received reconciliation. Listen, it was an act of love. It was a desire of reconciliation. There was a war between us and God, and we did nothing to solve that problem, but God did everything to solve that problem. God offered Jesus Christ as a real and physical sacrifice to pay for my sin debt and to pay for your sin debt. Now, I want, you to, I want, I want to be sure that you process this in your mind. God the Father offered up God the Son to pay your sin debt against God because he wants to have a right relationship with you. And in order for that to be possible, your sin needs to be atoned for. And the only one that is capable of atoning for your sin is Jesus Christ. It can only be accomplished through Jesus Christ. Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, was born for that very reason. He was to be your sin-bearing sacrifice. So that lie that you told to your spouse last week, or that inappropriate thing that you might have been involved in, that makes you and me, for the sins that I've committed, unholy. Unholy. But, but we, have, we have a God who wants to make us holy. He, want, he wants to make us holy so that we can have a right relationship with him. The reality is, is that James tells us, forever, whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point becomes guilty of it all. But listen, Christ, Jesus Christ, can and is willing to pay not simply for one sin, but for all transgressions. I love this verse, 2 Corinthians 2, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians 5.21, and it says this, For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. That's a beautiful truth. This is, what we, this is why we're so excited about Christmas. Because it's the starting point of Christ going to the cross. Romans chapter 5 verse 1 says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Peace with God is available only through Christ. Only through trusting Jesus Christ as your sin bearer. The very, the very real question for you this morning, there are several for you this morning, are this. Do you realize that you have sinned against a holy God? I remember coming to that realization some 25, 30 years ago, realizing that I had sinned against a holy God and that I was in trouble with him. But yet I also understood that he loved me. But there was a real weight that I bore as I understood that reality. Do you realize that your sin is a big deal to God? 
Sin is a big deal to God. I know it's not politically correct to talk about sin. I get that. And you can send me letters if you want, and we can still be friends. But the fact of the matter is, the fact of the matter is, is that sin is a big deal to God. There is literally hell to pay. And I don't say that in condemnation. I say that because I'm concerned that there may be at least one person here that's never heard this before. And it's their opportunity to turn their lives over to Jesus Christ. Do you realize that not only is your sin a big deal to God, but do you realize that you are loved by God in spite of your sin? Isn't that good? That you are loved by God in spite of your sin. Do you realize that God provided a way through Christ so that, you, so that you could have a right relationship with God? That you no longer need to be the one to pay for your sin in hell? Instead, Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, his burial and his resurrection are sufficient to cancel out your debt, your sin debt against God and give you the promise of eternal life. I remember that day when I fully placed my trust in Jesus Christ by faith. He radically changed my life. In fact, it wasn't too long after I came to faith in Jesus Christ, I told my wife, I think I'm called to the ministry. And she said, are you crazy? <laughs> She's a really good wife. I don't mean to paint her in a bad light. But the fact of the matter is, is that giving our lives to Christ is a beautiful fruit of what God has done in our lives. Listen, God wants to give you eternal life. If you have eternal life here today, I hope that this is resonating with your soul. I hope that you are saying, praise God, I've made that decision. I am a follower of Jesus Christ. I know that if I take my last breath today, I will, I will open my eyes and I will see Jesus face to face. And it will be the best Christmas I've ever, I've ever celebrated. Because I'll be with my Jesus. Because Jesus knows his sheep. He says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them unto me, is greater than all, and no one will snatch them out of my Father's hand, for I and the Father are one. Folks, this is why Jesus Christ was born. This is why Isaiah calls him the Prince of Peace. This is why we say that the shadow of the cross hung over the manger of the baby Jesus. He was born to die so that you could have the opportunity to live. By faith, by faith, you can be living the new life even today. Jesus is the wonderful counselor. He is the mighty God. He is the everlasting Father. And He is the Prince of Peace. 2,000 years ago, a seemingly insignificant little couple went into Bethlehem. And while they were there, that young woman gave birth to a little baby boy. And, and this insignificant birth to this insignificant family was the catalyst for the largest revolution to ever come onto the face of this earth. Why? Because this little baby was the wonderful counselor. This little baby is the mighty God. This little baby is the everlasting Father. This little baby is your only hope for peace. This baby would be their king, our king, and he would provide for us a gift that we desperately need, the gift of eternal life. Audrey Myer in 1916 got it right when she penned her beloved song, His Name is Wonderful. Can I encourage you with something this morning? To refuse to, learn, to refuse to lose the wonder that Jesus is in this season, of who he is. Refuse to uh, have all the secular claptrap settle into your thinking. Refuse to allow to be more enamored with Santa and elves and Rudolph and Frosty and uh, all of those. And those are fine. Don't send me letters. I get it. But, but don't let them be superior in your thinking. Instead, I want you to be enamored with the holy God, the holy God of the Bible that God delivered for us some 2,000 years ago 
as the greatest gift imaginable. The gift that keeps on giving to those who repent and place their faith in the one and only Savior, Jesus Christ. I want you to stand up with me. And I want you to sing this song. Who knew this song was born on Christmas? But I think it's a wonderful song for us to sing together. His name is wonderful. And if you don't know it, we got the words up on the screen. Do your best. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord. He is the mighty King, master of everything. His name is wonderful.